So I'm taking a quick detour from Galatians today. And I just, as I was preparing, I just felt moved by the Spirit, I believe. I don't think it was just a sausage for my pizza the night before. I, I, I feel, here's the thing. I have a very heavy heart right now for people, particularly people in our area, um, all ages, but, but especially the young, uh, those who are, let's just say, zero to 35, 40, um, just watching the, some people are like, 40, that's not young. It is to me, okay? Um, it, they just, uh, they are just struggling and suffering. And so I have, I have two messages this morning, one this service and one the next service, and, they, and they, there's part one and part two. So you can stay for the second one if you want. You don't have to. They're both their own thing. But just letting you know, this is what was on my heart. And so I want to get into the word today about this stuff. I, I, I think we need to understand a couple things. We have an obligation, right, uh, to the Lord to do our best for him and what he's called us to do. And we have to ask ourselves things like, why do people join a body of believers? Why do people get together and join a body of believers? And there are a number of possible reasons. They join because the Bible is clear about the calling of a believer to join a church body, right? To be part of a church body. They join because they appreciate the worship or the teaching or something like that. But just as important as any of that, they join because they experience the love of God through his people. At the end of the day, there's a lot of places you can go and a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of church bodies. Some of them are great. Um, I don't really, you know, I don't know. Some of them may not be. But either way, people are likely to connect where they feel the love of God being shared with them. You know, the Mormons will go around and knock on the doors of, of houses, and you'd think to yourself by now, how successful can that be? But you would be surprised at how many people are lonely. And just the fact that somebody is willing to talk to them and wants to spend time with them is enough to get them drawn into these other things that we know aren't even, aren't even true. Mormonism is a false gospel. And we have the real gospel, and I don't know that we understand the level to which People get saved because they feel the love of God in his people. It is the love of God that moves people and makes people experience joy and peace and hope. It's the love of God which transforms people. And I have a heavy heart for our people. I have a heavy heart for uh, what has happened to the people in the Northwest of the United States. I I can't speak for everywhere. This may be very common. It may be in lots of places, but but I sense it and I feel it and I've experienced it here, here in this place. Um, And if you're sitting here, you were probably called to this place. That's why you're physically here. And I'm called to this place. And those of you online who listen later may be called to this place. Um, And if you are, we need to know how to love the people of this place. I've been watching, I've been learning uh, through the teaching and preaching of the word, through relationships, through just being in the lives of lots of people over the years here. Um, this is, I think, what's today? October 13th. So we're basically nine years since I started. Um, I think I first preached on like October 16th of 2015 here. Um, not in this building, but at, at the church. And so um, for the last nine years, roughly, I've been watching, I've been learning, I've been experiencing, I've been in, in relationships, I've been in the, in the trenches with people. And I've seen a lot of things um, in the lives of many, many people. I've seen brokenness. I've seen that people are feeling more and more isolated. People are feeling less and less joyful. Uh, People are feeling less and less loved. Bottom line. Our calling as Christ followers is to make disciples for Jesus Christ, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to teach them all to observe all that he has commanded. For lo, he is with us always, even to the end of the age. Amen, right? That's our calling. That's our commission. And if we're going to do that effectively, we've got to be like Jesus in the way that we love people. He loved people. There's really no question as you, as you read the scripture and you watch, it's not that he was, uh, you know, people, people try to kind of paint the picture of Jesus and sometimes literally paint the picture of Jesus as sort of this real soft and and, and uh, you know, he's got the sheep and he's petting the sheep and he does it. You know, Jesus was, was definitely a manly man in the sense that he went out and he spoke truth to power and he did all that. But one of the things that he did unquestionably was whoever he was around, the, the sinful, the broken, the hurting, those who needed healing, they felt that he loved them. 
they felt that he loved them. It's very clear because he did love them. And of course, he gave himself for them. And that kind of sacrificial, consuming fire, passionate, life-giving love changed the world. That's why we're still here talking about it today. And we are his disciples, and we are called to bring that same love to the world. The same love that he did. But we're in an age like the Laodicean church. And in in Revelation, we have... uh, John has a vision. The Apostle John has a vision of the end of the age. Uh, And you guys have probably read it. It's got all kinds of wild stuff in it. It's like, whoa, this is, I don't want to be here for this. And if you know Jesus, you won't be. Um, But there's these letters to the churches. And one of the churches is the church of Laodicea. And And I see the church of Laodicea in our age, in the Northwest in the way that we act. And so I want to read just, it's a, it's a quick letter that he sends to them, that, that Jesus sends. And he says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. See, Jesus wasn't always uh, petting sheep. Sometimes he was talking about vomiting people out of his mouth. And here's the thing. You need to be something. You need to be on one side or the other. That's why I I tend to prefer to talk to atheists than to apatheists, right? So if I can get an atheist, at least they're usually pretty passionate. They're wrong. But they're pretty passionate about being wrong. And so we can actually have a discussion because they're actually, they're at least hot for their thing. When you talk to an apatheist who goes, eh, eh, I don't like to think about it. I don't care. What's the big deal? Who cares? And it's just like, dude, get hot or cold. And so many people are in this situation, but so are some Christians who have gotten so used to the life that a Christian can live where you do the thing and you go to church and you listen to Caleb and you've got the mug that says Jesus and coffee and you, you, know, you do your thing, but where is the fire, right? Where's the love that's pouring out from you? Where's the, where's the thought about the people in your life that are going to hell, that need Jesus? It says, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And this is, this is us. This is our culture. This is our society right now. You, you can go, if you, if you want to, the next time we go on a missions trip, you know, we usually go to Honduras and go. Uh, my wife and I usually go also. And if you would like to see what people who are not rich look like, I can show you. Okay? When the kids like, find a half-wrapped piece of candy in the street and are just overjoyed, Something that none of your children would even look at because those little porkers have plenty of food at home, right? They're, they're, they're fine. Like, we're all fat and rich, and, and, I'm, and I'm the first one. Like, we, we, are, we need very little in our lives in comparison to how almost everybody lived at all times. Now, we have, we have relative wealth issues, right? There's some people who are really, really, really rich and some people who do struggle with the bills or whatever. But the bills for... Hot water, and I just think about my refrigerator yesterday. Like, dude, I can't believe I can just pull stuff out. I put stuff in here, close the door, and it gets cold. Like, it, I don't know, I'm dumb, but I just, that that was amazing to me. I was like, I can't believe we get to live like this, right? And so we've become rich, and what happens is when you're rich and you have, you can basically be comfortable most of the time, you get lukewarm because you have need of nothing, meaning you have no need of God. If you have no need of God, then you're not experiencing constantly the power, the glory of his love for you that he died for you. If you're not experiencing that constantly, it's not then putting in you that love for other people. And you end up wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked spiritually. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Real gold. Real gold. And white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with salve, eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke. Now, if this is us, or if this is, this is me sometimes, or if this is you sometimes, Jesus is rebuking us because he loves us. And we need to get right. And chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Turn away from that. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. 
To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we have the Laodicean church and we have this church that has become lukewarm. We have this church that's rich, has need of nothing. And I think that you can, it's still a church. He didn't say to the people of Odyssey, this is still a church. So they're still getting together, having church, doing all the stuff basically that we do, but there was no life in it. There's no, as C.S. Lewis would say, no blood and sap in it. There's nothing. It was, it was dry. It was cold. There was nothing there. And because of that, they're ineffective, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And that cannot be us, neither hot nor cold, doing all these things, but forgetting our first love. Jesus told us that the end times, that the end of the age would be lawless and that love would grow cold. Let's look at Matthew 24. By the way, there are Bibles in front of you if you, if you need one. Go ahead and use one of those. If you don't have a Bible home, take one of those home with you. That's our gift to you. Uh, you can have that. You don't owe us anything. You don't need to tell us about it. Just grab it, take it, have it at home so you have a Bible to read. Um, but you can use that or you can look up here however you want to do it or your phone, however you want to do it. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, you got to understand what's going on here. The temple, during Herod's time when Jesus is there, is one of the most magnificent things that you could ever imagine. I don't know how many of you have been to like really nice like European cathedrals um, or really nice American cathedrals. He's like a crazy churches that are just made and they're just and, and just stone and marble everywhere and like there's gold it looks like trump built it or something there's gold everywhere and that kind of stuff like right like they're in the, like very very gaudy um this would put all of that to shame in such a like it's a joke the stuff that we build is a joke compared to the temple so they're walking through this beautiful glorious temple And Jesus says, just so you know, there's not going to be one stone here left on another. And of course, that actually did happen. In 70 AD, Titus came in and he destroyed Jerusalem, burnt the temple. Unfortunately, with all the gold, it melted and went down between the cracks of all the stones and they wanted the gold. So they literally destroyed it and not one stone was left on another. That that happened in real life about 40 years after Jesus said this. But he's talking about the end of the age. It says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And he says a few things here. I want to focus on on one, but let's read them all. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. We've had lots of that. We still have that to this day. People who get these cults to follow after them and say that they're actually the second coming of Jesus. Um, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Yep. Check. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Check, check, check. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. Now, this one hit me, actually, pretty hard. I don't know that I've ever in my life, and it's not, I'm not that old, but you know, I'm 46, and in those 46 years, I don't know that I've ever seen a time like now where people get so easily offended. So often, so easily, it's like offense is so, like you gotta like, you're, it's eggshells everywhere. Like, okay, I'm sorry, I did, I, I, uh, you know, whatever you, you know, you can't, you, you, you look at somebody wrong, you do that, people are just offended, they're just, ah! Now I'll tell you why in a second, but They are very offended. They will betray one another. I've seen plenty of that in my own life. And will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. we got plenty of that going on. And because, because lawlessness will abound, definitely that's happening, the love of many will grow cold. Now, this lawlessness abounding and the love of many growing cold is, of course, connected, can't be unconnected from how people get so offended from why they betray one another and hate one another. It's like a vicious cycle. Lawlessness goes up. With lawlessness going up, loves go down. Now, now, why is that? I'll tell you one of the reasons why. 
Lawlessness meaning sinfulness, meaning violations. And I, and I think to, we're talking here about God's law, okay? We're not talking about people are, are breaking the speed limit because that's not really wrong, okay? As far as I'm concerned. Um, look, don't come at me. You know you don't always follow the speed limit. Some of you are like, yes, I do. Okay, well, you're not any fun. Um, anyway, no, be careful out there. Be careful out there. Do the right thing. <laughs> Let's cut that. Okay. Um, anyway, that's not what they're talking about. When he talks about lawless, he's talking about God's law. Okay? We, we talk about here, possibly you could say the natural law. Okay? What is being violated? The created order. That's the lawlessness that's happening, okay? You see it in, in several ways, right? But one of the most common and, and obvious ways that was going on in the first century and is going on now is the deviancy sexually, right? Because God had an order for the way he made that to, to work, and we found every possible way to violate that, right? That's just an example. There are others, right? All of these things are examples of that. The, the, the hating people, deceiving people, lying, cheating, stealing, all these things, they're not the, the way God made things to be. They're choices that we've made to be in sin. And once that happens, when lawlessness happens, you can't be lawless and be seeking righteousness and seeking God. And if you're not seeking righteousness, seeking God, and God is love, then your love is going to grow cold. And when your love grows cold, of course, it's going to cause offense. It's going to cause, uh, 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 where's the rest of it? Hate. And it's going to cause betrayal. And it's going to cause, which is going to cause more lawlessness, which is going to abound, which is going to cause, you see what's happening? And you can watch it in real time. You can watch this happening right now. And I can tell you, well, I have not been around forever. I have a decent, uh, you know, reasonable lay understanding of history. And I can tell you that there are times when this was more prominent and less prominent, but I've never seen anything quite like the spirit of the age right now, right? You have, you have there, there is a demonic spirit, a satanic spirit of the age. It, it permeates everything that you probably watch on Netflix, everything that, if you just watch shows these days and you just ask yourself, say, forget, I'm not going to try to be entertained by this at all. Most of it's not that entertaining anyway. But I'm going to try to see, what are they trying to say? What, what do they want me to just, because when you're watching a show, you're watching it for entertainment. And what happens is as you watch something for entertainment, they're underneath that, they're giving you something, right? There's something being given to you. And so if you just watch for that and start looking at what's actually happening, you go, you know what? Not only is it, is it relatively obvious, quite evil, demonic, but I'm not even sure they know they're doing it. That's, that's the level of it. They're, they're just, people are just acting lawlessly. In fact, if you want to talk about lawlessness in terms of the sexual deviancy, by the way, I haven't seen a show in I don't know how long, other than The Rings of Power, uh, which was on Amazon, which I do recommend. It's good. Um, but I haven't seen many shows at all that did not include necessarily at least one, if not many characters that were sexually deviant. That's a, that's a necessary part of any show these days. Now, why is that? Why, why do shows have to normalize? Why is the anti-hero the only kind of hero anybody wants to see anymore? Because, they want to, because people are trying to normalize a particular way of thinking. They're literally trying to conform you to the world. And what does that conforming do to you? It makes your love grow cold, right? And because we're under attack so much, we sort of retreat into ourselves, and we just try to survive it. I went on a whaling uh, boat, uh, whale watching. It wasn't a whaling, but I wasn't killing whales, okay? <laughs> I went on a whale watching trip. I was like in the fifth or sixth grade. And I decided to have some cornflakes and some um, hot chocolate. Yeah, you know where this is going. Um, before I went on this, this whale watching trip. Well, this boat likes to do this, right? And I haven't been on a lot of boats. I, this is, we lived in California at the time. Um, and I hadn't been in a lot of boats uh, because, you know, we weren't wealthy, so we didn't have a boat, you know. Um, and so I'm on the boat, and it's just this, and it's just this, and I'm like, you know what? I'm starting to feel a little funny. And a little later, when I woke up, because I, like, had sat down and, like, fall asleep, woke up, and there's the cornflakes and the, and the hot chocolate everywhere, right? And I can tell you that there was a point at which you're just holding on. It's like, get me off this dang boat. I want to go back to America, Right? <laughs> I don't know what we're doing out here in the ocean, don't care about whales, and you're just holding on. Now, that can happen to you in life. 
You can get to a point where you're like, I just need to survive today. I just need to make it today. And when you're in that mindset, I can just tell you, it's going to be difficult for your love not to grow cold because you're not practicing using it. And you're just hanging on. Now, there's a time and a place where you, there are seasons where you are just hanging on. But if your mindset isn't, my love needs to grow hot, not cold, not lukewarm, hot. If you're not in that mindset where that I'm here to do that because we're going to go be with Jesus forever. That's where we're going to go. Jesus, all of those who have come before us, who knew Jesus, we're going to be there forever. And the older you get, uh, Tiffany and I were talking about this, the older you get and the more of the people that you love and are in heaven already, like the easier it is to like sort of see this the way that you need to see it. When you're very young and everyone you know is alive, uh, you know, it's, it's a little harder to think this way. The older you get, the more you can be heaven focused. And I would say you should be that way young or old recognize that that's what this is about. So while we're here, our job is for our love not to grow cold, but to be hot. To be hot. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our neighbors ourselves. That's what we're here to do. And so we got to do that because, again, Paul's writing to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, that's where we are. They were, I mean, the last days technically started at that time. Right? But the, we're at the end of the end of the age. Now, in the last days, perilous times will come. They're perilous. I don't use that word very often. It's dangerous out there. I don't know who told you that it was going to be safe. I hope nobody did. I know that there are some uh, self-help people and some preachers out there who try to act like, hey, if you do this, that, or the other thing, you can basically not have to worry about stuff. And there are people who talk about how you should handle your money so you never have to worry. Let me just tell you something. There, there, there was a time when uh, the Russian government went through, uh, a, a, you know, in the, in the Depression and so on, where literally there were people who were paid three times a day, these workers, and they had to pay them with wheelbarrows full of money. Literally, it was, it was, it was the money was less valuable as money than it was as kindling, right? You can have... You can have infl- massive hyperinflation that happens, and people who had money all of a sudden had nothing. Okay? Your money is not safe. Welcome to Acts Church, by the way. I'm going to tell you a few things. Your money is not safe. Your health is not safe. You are not safe. God did not, did not promise you safety. He promised that he loves you. He promised that he'd be with you, even to the end of the age. Amen. That's what he said. That's what he said. He didn't say that you're going to be safe. You're not going to be safe. Perilous times will come. Stop bothering with all your focus about how do, I, how do I not have the times be perilous? Don't waste your time. They're going to be perilous. There is no way to avoid that. You know, Run away to the hills and live in a little bunker by yourself and grow a long beard, ladies, guys, whoever <laughs> wants to do that. right? Go, go do that, and I guess maybe you can avoid some of it. Kind of boring. Or you can live an adventurous life in Christ, understanding that the times are perilous. And loving like crazy and seeing people come to know Jesus. You can do one or the other. For men will be, and here's what here's what I want you to focus on. Remember, we're supposed to love God and our neighbor as ourselves. That's what our life is supposed to look like. But what happens at the end times when these perilous times come? For men will be lovers of what? Themselves. Lovers of money. Boasters. Proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. So what do we got? They love themselves. They love money. They love pleasure. They don't love God. And they're unloving. That, you need to understand that's where you live. That's where we are. Satan has gotten a stronghold on so many people. And, and right now, I'm, I'm talking about this area. This is where we're called. The Northwest, particularly Vancouver, Portland. This is what I see. People are all of these things. They are lovers of money. right? Lovers of themselves. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And all of us can be tempted to be there because we're rich. We have need of nothing, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get to that spot. But that's not who we're called to be. A few weeks back, we were in 1 Peter. We studied this. But the end of all things is at hand. 
Therefore, because of that, because of this, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Listen, fervent. That's another word we don't use a lot. Think fiery. Have a fiery love for one another. Fervently love one another. Because that's the times we're in. Because the end of all things is at hand. Because of that, you need to be serious and watchful in your prayers. And you need to have, above all, have a fervent love for one another. For love will co- cover a multitude of sins. Now, why do we need to have this fervent love for one another? Because the scripture tells us to. And because that is the thing that will give us the ability to make it through the perilous times. That is the thing that will give us the ability to be effective in this adventure. Without it, we struggle. Without it, Satan picks us off one by one. Attack, attack, attack. You don't feel the love, whatever. People, I've seen it. People drift away from the church. Or people get so focused on loving themselves or loving money or loving pleasure and they drift away. But had we loved them well, maybe they wouldn't have. Had we been less focused on making it, making it through, and more focused on how can we be effective, maybe we would have, we would have seen more people able to make it through and not get choked out by the world. So we've got to be the body of Christ. And for the next five or six minutes, I'm going to try to walk through this. Um, we're not going to read the rest of that first Peter passage. Okay. First Corinthians 12, if you want to turn there. So we're going to go through, we're going to try to go through first Corinthians 12 from verse 12 to the end. And then the second service, we're just doing first Corinthians 13. So that's the sort of one, two punch of this thing. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. What are we saying here? The body, guess who that is? That's you and me. We make up the body. Who was it? Was it Voltron that had like the different parts that would come together? Yeah, Voltron. What do you tell you, old guy? Yeah, it, it was a cartoon back in the day. But like, like we're, we're all parts, feet, hands, head, nose, butt, whatever. Everybody's a part of the body. I'll tell you who that last part is. No, I'm not going to point at anybody. Um, it's probably me. Many members, right? But all the members that one body be many are one body. So we're, we're together. We're united. So also is Christ. Christ is not divided. Christ is united. We are united because we are his body. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, baptized in the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. So you, not only are part of, if you're part of this local expression of the body of Christ, you're part of this body, but also as a Christ follower, you're part of the body of Christ throughout the whole world, both now and forever. You are part of a big body. You are a piece. You are an important piece of that body. Called to do things, not called to sit around and wait, not called to say, oh, I'm rich, I have need of nothing, and become lukewarm. Called to be on fire, loving the rest of the body, and doing things so that God can draw people into his body. That's your call. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have been made, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit. Since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is that. If you are a Christ, well, you have the Holy Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. The, the, the Christian church is the body of Christ. It is not one member. It's not one person. It's not even one local expression of the body of Christ. It is the whole church. So we have the universal church all through time and space, strong as an army with banners. And then we have the local church. And then you have you as an individual. You as an individual are part of this body. Okay? That's what you are. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? No, that's not how it works. First of all, your foot shouldn't be talking. If it is, you need medicine. (laughs) And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? No, obviously not. These are rhetorical questions. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And gross, by the way. It's a big, like, eye, you know. It's like, you can just imagine. I'm sure there's a horror movie about that. Right? The, the whole body where I, you wouldn't be able to hear. All you'd be able to do is just see, right? You wouldn't even be able to think because the eye's got to be connected to the brain like it's nothing. It'd just be gross, okay? You don't want that. If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? 
But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. How did he set them in the body? Just as he pleased. Are you going to complain about the fact that you're not whatever, right? We're using a metaphor here, eyes and feet and ears and whatever. You're, I, I, I wanted to be this, or I wanted to do that, or I wanted to be on that team or, or do this part of ministry or whatever. Are you going to complain about that? Because God has set them in the body just as he pleased. So you have to take that up with him, or you could be humble, loving, and united with the body. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Nowhere. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Sometimes you feel that way, that you seem to be a weaker member of the body, because I've been there. You're necessary. Necessary. Without you, we don't have a body. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. Essentially, we got all these different parts, and they're all needed. They're all needed for the part that they play. And you shouldn't worry about whether you're this or whether you're that or whether enough people recognize what you do. There are people who do all kinds of stuff for this church you know nothing about. And they're not looking for you to know anything about it. They're, they're, they're satisfied to just do their part of the body because they love Jesus. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body. No division. No division. How many people have have you been around that have talked about church hurt? How many people that have talked about, hey, I went through this, I went through that, the people did this, the people did that? There should be no schism in the body. So when we see that, something is wrong. Either a wolf in sheep's clothing has come in and tried to devour the sheep, or you've got two real Christ followers who have not read this. You should have no division between any of you. How are you going to go out and love the world when, we, when we're not even loving each other within the body? We have these little things against each other. There should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care. I literally just did a search for this word. In the scripture, when I was when I was uh, looking at uh, doing this, and this is one that came up: the same care for one another. Do you care for one another? Do people come to this church and feel cared for, not greeted? We do that sometimes too much, right? Somebody comes in, it's like everybody's like, "Hey," and it's like, "All right, okay," you know, easy. I go to Crossroads and wouldn't have to talk to anybody. Uh, wherever. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. was not a knock on anybody. I'm just saying sometimes we overdo it a little bit. And that's okay. I'd rather overdo it than underdo it. But do you care? Do you care? Because we need to care for one another. That's our calling is to care. Jesus gives us this in John 13, 33 through 35. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you. It's a new commandment. Love new stuff. That you love one another as I have loved you. Now that's, I mean, that's a big thing to ask. That we would love one another as Jesus loved us. That you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How do they know? That you are actually a disciple of Jesus by the love you have for one another. Not because you're doing miracles. That's not it. You go out and cast out demons and heal the sick and raise the dead. and do it. That's not what he says, how they'll know that you're a disciple. How will they know that you love one another? When somebody comes in here and wants to know, is this church really a Jesus church? The way they're going to know is how you treat one another. How you love one another. John 17, 20 through 23. I did not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. By the way, this is Jesus praying for you and me. If you are a Christ, if you're a believer, and you believe in God, he is saying that the disciples that were with him in that moment, they were going to witness and testify. People were going to believe, people were going to believe, people were going to believe. And 2,000 later, us, he's praying for us too. Those who will believe 
And this is what he prays for us, that they may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world, why? That the world may believe that you sent me. If we're one, not only does it show that we're disciples of Jesus, it also testifies to the world that Jesus Christ is God. Now, we can go out and say it. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus is Lord. We can go, do, go and say that. And people will be like, eh, okay, whatever. But you know what actually makes them believe that Jesus is, is Lord? Is us being one. Because it's not natural to the world. What's natural to the world is strife and difficulty, fighting, backbiting, lovers of money, lovers of selves, lovers of pleasure, not lovers of God. That's what's normal in the world. So when we're one, people go, how is that possible? And we go, we don't know. It's Jesus. And then they believe. That's a reality. And the glory which you gave me, speaking to praying to the Father, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. What is it when we're one? People know that God sent, that the Father sent the Son and they know that he loves us. Now, if I'm looking for a group of people to connect, I want to be part of the group of people that the Father loves. And so if they know that, they're likely to move that way. Let's quickly go through because I'm, I'm over time. Uh, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. We're back in 1 Corinthians. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. This is how we show love for one another, okay? I shouldn't have to explain this too much, but if, you're having, if something good happened, we should be rejoicing with you. If something bad happened, we should be mourning with you. Hopefully you see that within the context of your life groups. We should see it in the context of the larger church. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. You're both. You're the body and individually a member of the body of Christ. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles and gift of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. It's going through all these gifts. But then he says this, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. These are rhetorical. Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, the greater gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. And that is what we will be talking about in the second service, this most more excellent way. Go ahead and start passing that stuff out. We're a little late here. I implore you, brothers and sisters, people need love. There is no uh, church growth uh, you know, uh, philosophy that beats out just loving people. And so I encourage you to love those around you. I encourage you to love every person that walks into this building on a Sunday morning. I encourage you to love passionately one another. That the world may know that God sent you. That God sent Jesus. That Jesus is God. 